Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the monthly IA seminar. It's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Michael Obster. He is an incoming assistant professor of computer science at uh, Johns Hopkins University. That means you're going to see him next fall. So he's currently a postdoc in the machine learning department at uh, CMU. His research focuses on making sure that machine learning healthcare is safe and effective using tools from uh, causal inference and statistics. His work has been published at a range of machine learning venues like neural apps, ICML, AI stats, and KDD, including works with clinical collaborations from Mass General, Brigham, NYU, Langone, and Bass Israel Deskum Medical Center. He has also worked on clinical applications of machine learning, including work on learning effectiveness, antibiotic treatment. Uh, policies. He earned his undergrad degree at statistics in Harvard and his PhD in computer science at MIT. So let's welcome Michael for the talk. All right, thank you. I'm going to uh, share my slides. Let's make sure you can all see that all right. Yes, sir. Yes. Excellent. All right. Well, without further ado, uh, thanks everyone for having me. Um, my name is Michael, as you know, and I'll be talking today about uh, some of my work on moving us towards rigorously tested and reliable machine learning for health. Um, so there's a lot of excitement around applying machine learning in healthcare domains. There's an increasingly large amount of data, which we hope is useful for guiding things like treatment decisions, early diagnosis of disease, and so forth. And to ground us in a concrete example, I'm going to talk a little bit to start about machine learning for antibiotic selection. So antibiotic resistance is a huge and growing problem in the US and worldwide, as evidenced by some of these statistics, as well as some of these uh, sort of scary headlines here at the bottom. And one of the most common settings in which antibiotics are prescribed is that of urinary tract infections. So UTIs impact most women during their lifetime and result in millions of prescriptions per year. Now, the clinical context is that a patient will arrive with a UTI and doctors have to decide uh, which of a potentially long list of antibiotics to prescribe. Uh, now, this is an area in which machine learning can help. Integrating information about a specific patient's medical history with local patterns of antibiotic resistance to make a recommendation to the doctor around uh, which treatment is most likely to be effective for this patient. Now that type of that specific example is drawn from work that I've done with clinical collaborators at Mass General Brigham, where we took uh, electronic medical records for a couple thousand patients of this type, and we developed a algorithm based on machine learning to do what I just described. And now if you evaluate that algorithm retrospectively on historical data, uh, it suggests that there's a lot of opportunity for improvement. Uh, algorithmic recommendations were associated with fewer ineffective antibiotics, as well as fewer broad spectrum antibiotics, which is an important consideration for reducing future resistance. Um, but of course, with any paper like this, you might reasonably say to yourself, okay, you know, this makes for maybe a nice publication, but remember, this is all evaluation on historical data. Um, it's an indication of maybe how this would perform in practice. But when can we rely on these type of retrospective results to actually hold up in the clinic? And so today I'm really going to focus with this type of thing as a motivating example on two concerns you might reasonably have. So one concern is that, you know, when I claim, you know, my algorithm will result in better outcomes, I'm making a causal claim. I'm drawing a causal conclusion, uh, which requires, in many cases, pretty strong assumptions when we're dealing, as is common, with observational data, as opposed to, say, data from a randomized trial. And I'll explain that in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, but secondly, even if we have some algorithm or learning model that performs well at a particular hospital at a particular point in time, its performance may vary across time, locations, and other deployment contexts. So with that in mind, the focus of a lot of my work and what I'll be talking about today is trying to make progress towards answering this question. How do we make machine learning as rigorously tested and reliable as any medication or diagnostic test? And I'm gonna draw a loose analogy here to drug development, where we go from promising candidate on the left to deployment on the right, but in between we have this exhaustive and transparent process of validation and iteration. So too with uh, machine learning models, what I'll be talking about today kind of fits in here, uh, assessing and improving the reliability of our models and the conclusions that we draw from them, 
before wider deployment. Now to motivate this a bit more, um, I want to sort of cite a cautionary tale that's maybe well known kind of within my specific niche, but uh, perhaps not so much outside of it. So this is a study done by folks at the University of Michigan, where they evaluated a sepsis prediction model that has already been deployed in hundreds of hospitals in the United States. For those who don't know, sepsis is a deadly syndrome that kills hundreds of thousands of people in the US every year. So catching it early is a high priority. Um, unfortunately, the authors found that the performance of this model was substantially worse in practice than reported by the model developers in their internal documentation. And for those who aren't familiar with AUC, you can think of it as accuracy. Now, this uh, study cost quite a stir when it came out in June of 2021. Uh, and in September of last year, the FDA made some noise about potentially needing to regulate models like this more stringently. And of course, a month after that, uh, the model developers claim to have fixed uh, some of the problems with their algorithm. But let's you know, think about that in the context of what we would love to be able to do. We'd love to be able to collect retrospective data, learn from that data, whether it be a prediction model like in the sepsis example or a treatment policy like in the antibiotic example earlier. And then you know, we'd love to deploy that broadly. We want to help patients. We want to improve outcomes. And when I talk about reliable machine learning in this context, you know, that can be a pretty broad, perhaps vague term. So what I mean by that, the purposes of this talk, is simply machine learning that performs as well as we expect. So in the sepsis example, we saw a case where the model developers thought that the model was quite good, um, but in practice, it actually performed quite poorly. So this suggests the need to stop and ask how we build confidence in our results prior to deployment. And I'm going to talk about a few ways of doing that from a sort of technical perspective, taking advantage of clinical expertise, data from randomized trials, uh, and stress tests for models. And that's going to correspond to uh, three pieces of work that I'll be discussing today. Um, starting with this first piece on how we make it easier for domain experts to find flaws in um, machine learning derived models for decision making. And the context here is that there is substantial interest in applying what's called reinforcement learning, a uh, branch of machine learning, to optimize treatments in critical care. Now, on the right hand side here, uh, there are many papers on this topic, and that's all this figure on the right is trying to say. Uh, to call out a specific example, which we'll return to, these Papers have the following flavor. You know, the AI clinician learns optimal treatment strategies for sepsis. Um, the question we're going to be trying to answer is less, you know, how do you learn these models in the first place? And more, how do you help a domain expert decide whether or not it's worth doing even a small pilot study to investigate whether or not, um, you know, these algorithms could help in practice? And before I talk about kind of sanity checking, these models, I need to talk a little bit about what they are and the problem they're trying to solve. So we'll, the problem setting is that we have data on patient's health state, um, call that ST at the top. And then we also have historical data on the treatment decisions that were made for these patients. And we have this data rolled out over time, ultimately ending in an outcome for each patient, whether that be survival and being discharged safely from the hospital or death. And the goal is to learn from this data to make better treatment decisions. So one form of learning from this data is called model-based planning, where we learn a model to anticipate how different actions will impact patient health. You could imagine in the best case here, if we have some model that could anticipate the outcome of this particular treatment that the patient would enter into a critical state, we could use that to derive a treatment policy mm -hmm. that's going to maximize positive outcomes. Um, where positive outcomes here are really this long-term outcome on the right-hand side of you know, safely discharging someone from the hospital. So what I've just described is called model-based reinforcement learning, where we take our historical data, we learn some model of dynamics, uh, and then we use that model to derive some treatment policy. And the important thing to focus on here is this treatment policy is a kind of black box. You can think of it as something that just takes as input everything we currently know about the patient and outputs a recommended next action. But you know, because this talk is about you know, making our models more reliable and so on and so forth, it's worth talking about what can go wrong in these sort of settings. So to illustrate, I'm going to use a pretty simple example um, where we're just deciding on a single action uh, you know, which of these two treatments should we use? 
And if we first go look in our historical data, we might observe that drug A leads to higher, and let's say that means better outcomes than drug B. Of course, if we learn a model on this data, pretty simple data set, uh, we'll conclude that drug A is better, and the learned policy would be that we should always give drug A. Uh, unfortunately, if we now return to this left-hand side and stratify our data by age on the x-axis, we can see that that conclusion was actually quite wrong. Um, for all age groups, drug B leads to higher, again, better outcomes than drug A. So what went wrong? Well, the challenge here in this synthetic example is that we didn't account for all the relevant variables. Uh, age here in the parlance is a confounding factor, and we were misled earlier because drug B is prescribed more often to older, sicker patients. So the takeaway here is that if we don't set up our problem correctly, we can get models that come to the wrong conclusion, and we can get actions from our policy that are potentially incorrect. So to recap what I've just said, you know, the typical approach here is we collect some data, we learn some model, and we derive some treatment policy from that model, or at least this is the model-based RL approach. But based on what I just said, we might not trust this model uh, too much uh, because we're aware of some of those potential issues. And so the question is, how do we enable domain experts here to sanity check this model and policy using their clinical knowledge? And we're going to adopt the following approach uh, to doing so, which is something we refer to as counterfactual policy introspection. We're going to be asking, okay, the model claims 95% survival rate if you followed its recommendations, um, but can it explain that? Can it tell us why in the context of real patients? And so we are going to take actual patients uh, from our data set, some of whom died, some of whom lived, and ask, what does the model claim would have happened differently if we had followed the model's recommended actions? And that's going to give us what we call counterfactual claims, which are claims from the model about what would have happened differently to specific patients. Part of what I'll talk about on the technical side in a moment is how we extract these claims from a given model. But to give you some more intuition for what these claims look like, a counterfactual claim is not simply something like, here's the outcome that would have happened at the very end if you had followed my recommendations. A counterfactual claim is something like, here is the full evolution of how a patient's state would have evolved had you followed you know, the recommendations of the model. And the benefit of drilling down into this level of detail is that it allows clinicians you know, potentially to ask, are these claims reasonable in the first place, whether against their own clinical knowledge or the medical record for a patient? So for instance, in this case, it may be that this particular patient didn't receive early administration of fluids uh, because of some contraindication. And the point here is that the counterfactual claims that our models are making, which implicitly back up that 95% survival uh, number, may not be reasonable. And as we'll see later with some real data, unreasonable claims are sometimes useful for finding flaws in the original model. So to sort of put this all together, the, uh, the approach that you know, we're talking about in this part of the talk takes as input a model of discrete dynamics that someone else might have trained, some treatment policy, and actual patient trajectories, and gives as output, you know, these gener these detailed counterfactual claims for each patient, um, which we can then filter through via various heuristics. For instance, selecting out patients who the model claims would have lived, but who in reality died. And then the third part of our approach is to assess these counterfactual claims alongside the medical record. So we'll talk briefly now about sort of some of the technical details around how we or at least try and provide some intuition for how we generate these claims. Then for parts two and three, I'll talk about a real data example to illustrate. So how do we generate counterfactual claims? Well, we start with this model of dynamics. And the first step is to reparameterize this model as what's called a structural causal model. So this is equivalent to that original model, uh, probabilistic model, where all of the randomness is captured by this variable ut. And what this allows us to do is to derive counterfactual claims via the following process. So first we observe some trajectory, say the patient was stable, they got drug A, then they went into a critical state. Uh, we can sort of put this in the framework above and infer something for this patient based on their outcome about this sort of patient specific variable UT capturing some of the patient specific perhaps factors that we don't uh, observe. And that allows us to then replay under new actions and ask for this specific patient, given what we know, what do we think would have happened differently? Part of the challenge here is 
how we define this structural causal model from sort of a technical perspective. Um, in particular, there are uh, multiple ways of doing this reparameterization, which may imply different counterfactual claims. So that motivates you know, part of the, the contribution in this line of work, which is choosing the type of restrictions we want our counterfactuals to satisfy. So suppose we have, again, this factual trajectory. Again, a counterfactual claim here is a claim from the model as to what would have happened differently to this patient had they received drug B instead of drug A, taking into account the fact that when they received drug A, they went into a critical state. And so one restriction uh, that we may want to intuitively impose is that the model should only tell us that things would have been different if it, for instance, transitioning to the stable state, if the model believes that drug B tends to lead to better outcomes in this setting than drug A. So that's represented mathematically up top as follows. But perhaps surprisingly, many methods for generating counterfactuals don't satisfy this type of restriction, particularly when you go beyond sort of this simple binary setting with two states, as I've shown here. So part of the contribution of this work is a method for generating counterfactuals, uh, which satisfies this type of restriction for models with more than two discrete states. As we'll see later with a real data example, some of the models people use in practice have, say, 750 different states for patients, as opposed to just stable and critical. But rather than dwelling on some of those details, I want to move on to talking through uh, applying these counterfactuals to a sort of real model and, and demonstrating these next two steps. So for this purpose, we'll be returning to that paper I mentioned earlier on, this AI clinician paper, where we're going to replicate the model from this paper and then apply our approach to sanity check, uh, the model that comes out. So in this paper, they follow the process that I described earlier. They take some data, they learn a model based on that data. This is a model with 750 uh, different states to represent patient health. And they derive a policy from that model um, for treating sepsis. And uh, of course, the, the first step here is selecting out patients who have perhaps interesting counterfactuals. So this is going to be a patient, spoiler alert, where the model is claiming this patient would have survived under the new policy um, when in reality this patient died. So we'll start by reviewing the actual course for this patient, who is uh, a patient in this uh, MIMIC3 data set, um, so represents a real person. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, on the top, what I'm showing are vital signs for visualization. There, are, In reality, there are many more than this, as well as uh, two actions that are being optimized by the new policy. And the black line denotes the actual trajectory, so what actually happened to this patient. Um, and the red X at the end of each of these lines indicates the outcome. You know, the trajectory ended and this patient died within 90 days. Um, now, part of the benefit of looking at real patients is we can go back and actually pull up their medical record as well. So going beyond some of the numbers and statistics on the left to actually digging into to more of the story. So I'm not a, a medical doctor myself, but I collaborate with medical doctors. So I asked my colleague here, Dr. Sanjat Kanjalal, you know, okay, reading the discharge notes and so on from this patient's stay, what else do we know about them? And we sort of constructed the following synopsis. So this patient was admitted to the hospital after collapsing at home unexpectedly. Uh, when they got to the hospital, it was discovered for the first time that they had stage 3A lung cancer, leading to lung infection and accumulation of fluids in the lung. Um, and they died in the hospital, unfortunately, two weeks after admission, in part due to complications of this lung cancer. Now, now that we have sort of the full context for this patient, we can now ask, okay, what does the model think would have happened differently if we had followed its recommendations? So that's shown here on the left, where the blue lines denote the sort of counterfactual claims of the model. And we can see on the bottom uh, what the model would have recommended differently in terms of actions. And we can see on the top, uh, in the, again, the blue line, how it thinks uh, the patient's health would have evolved differently under its recommended actions. And I'm going to sort of walk through this in a bit more detail, but the goal is going to be to ask, is this counterfactual claim reasonable given what we know about the patient? Um, and the short answer is uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, given the uh, nature of the talk, no, um, but I'm going to walk through it. So the first thing we observe is that there really isn't a clinical basis for the actions being taken by the model. So what you can see here at the bottom on the left is that the model is recommending maximum doses of a class of drugs called vasopressors, 
and which doesn't really have a clinical basis uh, for this particular patient. Secondly, uh, perhaps more glaringly and also interestingly, something we can only really see because we have these counterfactuals, is that uh, the model doesn't seem to anticipate the consequences of its own recommended actions. So we would expect vasopressors, a class of drugs that are designed in part to raise blood pressure, to have that effect, to raise someone's blood pressure. But if we look at the mean blood pressure vital sign, we see that the model doesn't anticipate such an increase. In fact, the blue line is almost indistinguishable from the black line on the left. And finally, the model is making a somewhat implausible claim uh, in this trajectory as a whole. You can see that all of these end in a green dot, indicating that the model thinks that at this point in time, the patient would be safely discharged home and survive past 90 days. Now, we know that's implausible in part because we know why this patient actually died, which is due to their lung cancer. Um, and really, realistically, neither of the actions considered by the model would have prevented that outcome. And so we can, on the one hand, conclude, okay, maybe this counterfactual is a little unreasonable. But interestingly, by drilling down into this level of depth, we also realized something, which is that this factor of lung cancer, you know, this important fact about the patient is actually not something that was included in the original model. And so that, to wrap up this part of the talk, that sort of points to, you know, how we hope to use tools like this in practice. So we've developed our model in our policy based on our data. You know, the first step that we've talked about is extracting these kind of counterfactual claims, which we can then assess by the medical record and clinical intuition. And the hope, you know, not a guarantee, but the hope is that by doing so, we might be able to identify flaws in problem design. Like in this example, where we discovered that there were potential missing confounders like lung cancer, which actually weren't included in the original model, enabling us to perhaps go back, you know, repeat the process of training and sort of reevaluate. Um, but I'm going to move on from that example now um, to talking about other ways of kind of incorporating um, perhaps domain expertise in a sense into the learning of sort of treatment policies with machine learning. And here I'm going to focus less on incorporating, you know, a doctor's expertise through that kind of manual review and more on incorporating gold standard data when it's available. And so in particular, our motivation here is going to be to try and get the best of both worlds. On the one hand, randomized control trials are a gold standard in medicine for a variety of very good reasons. Um, the most important of which is that they are randomized. So that whole problem I had before, you know, did we measure all the right confounders, for instance, isn't a concern in a randomized trial. Um, the challenge is that they have strict eligibility criteria and are often much smaller scale um, than observational studies shown here on the right, which have this major problem that they might be confounded um, but tend to be more representative uh, and much larger scale. And so the motivation here is going to be, how do we use limited experimental data um, when it is available to us? So as I said before, um, sorry, as I said before, uh, randomized control trials have strict eligibility criteria. One example of that um, is that pregnant women were not included in the original uh, COVID-19 vaccine trials. That's a, perhaps a broader topic for discussion, um, but it's an example of the fact that randomized control trials often don't include the full diversity of patients that we see in the real world. Meanwhile, in observational studies, that's data from treatments actually being given in the wild, so to speak, uh, it's often a more representative type of data set, but may be subject to these problems like confounding. So the contribution I'll be talking about from this line of work is a method for using randomized controlled trial data to generate valid confidence intervals on causal effects in these types of underrepresented groups. Um, and now, before I proceed, I, that was a bit of a mouthful, valid confidence intervals on causal effects. So I'm going to define some terms. The first is a causal effect. What do I mean by that? Uh, there's a little bit of math up here on the screen, but you can think of this as just the average difference between what would happen to you if you got treatment and what would happen to you if you did not get treatment measured with respect to some outcome, uh, given that you are in some group. So this is just averaged over a particular group that we care about. And when I talk about a confidence interval, you should think this causal effect is some number. It exists. We just don't know it. And that's represented by the white diamond here. Now, typically, we might think of coming up with some point estimate, some uh, estimate derived, for instance, using machine learning, uh, represented by the 
sort of blue diamond, that's tau hat. Uh, but what I'm really going to focus on today is providing these confidence intervals, where when I say something is a valid confidence interval, you should translate that as, you know, if I say this is a 95% confidence interval, then these brackets should contain the true value, that is the white diamond, at least 95% of the time. So with that um, sort of stat 101 uh, out of the way, the setting we'll be in is one in which we have data from multiple observational studies, kind of shown here, where each observational study has its own estimate and its own confidence interval. Now, this is actually fairly common in the setting where, for instance, you're running a distributed uh, network study where data is analyzed separately at individual sites, individual hospitals, and then the results are aggregated centrally um, because of privacy concerns with sort of sharing data from all the hospitals. And so the question then becomes, now that I've got my hospital-specific estimates, how should I aggregate that evidence across multiple sites or multiple studies? And a standard meta-analysis approach would have you assume that all of these studies are in some sense valid, like there's no confounding at any of these sites. Uh, and in this work, what we're going to do is to relax that type of assumption to instead assume that at least one of these studies is valid, though we might not know which one. And so the ingredients required for that uh, are going to be twofold. One, these estimates from a randomized trial, though recall they don't include estimates for the population we care about, and estimates for multiple observational studies, where this, again, this main assumption is just going to be that at least one of those observational studies uh, was valid in some sense. And the approach is going to proceed in two steps. And I'm going to walk through the intuition uh, to give you sort of a flavor. The first step is, quote unquote, validation of observational studies on shared subgroups. And the second step is pessimistic aggregation. And I'll explain why that word validation is in quotes. So this first part is validation. Um, again, we have estimates from each of those three observational studies for this population, but we do not have an estimate from the randomized trial shown at the bottom. What we do have, though, is estimates from the randomized trial for other subpopulations. Um, and so the first simple idea is to compare estimates on those shared subgroups uh, to understand if our observational studies are agreeing with that kind of gold standard estimate. Now, insofar as they agree, we give them a green check mark. And insofar as they significantly disagree, we use that as evidence to remove studies as potentially being contaminated by confounding bias or other concerns. Now, the second challenge, and the reason I used validation in quotes before, is that just because something has passed that basic filter doesn't guarantee that it's free of confounding and that it's completely uh, accurate. For instance, we may have failed to reject studies simply because we don't have enough data to conclude that the estimates are inaccurate. And so the question becomes, how do we aggregate then across the studies that remain? And so what we demonstrate you know, in part in our work is that a relatively simple approach, once you've done that first approach, uh, again, under this main assumption that at least one of the original three was correct, uh, is to take a union of the confidence intervals that remain. And we demonstrate that this provides uh, a valid confidence interval in the group that we care about. Now, to evaluate this sort of algorithm in a bit more detail on some real data, we turn to the Women's Health Initiative data set, um, which is really valuable for evaluating methods like ours because it consists of both a randomized trial uh, as well as an observational study on the same treatment uh, collected in parallel. And so to evaluate our approach, we're going to generate some additional data sets with artificially induced selection bias. That's going to give us our multiple observational studies. Uh, and then we're going to hold the subgroup out of the randomized trial um, and treat that estimated effect as the ground truth that we want to recover without using data from that subpopulation of the RCT. So using kind of the data shown up top, uh, we apply our method, get a confidence interval, and then the way we'll be assessing our confidence intervals is whether or not they actually capture this ground truth estimate, the red diamond. And this will be repeated several times. Now, the takeaway of all that, uh, I'm going to show in a moment, but first I want to talk about how you evaluate approaches like this. So the first thing we care about is called coverage, and we want that to be high. That is the percentage of time that our intervals cover the RCT estimate. And the second thing we care about is length. We want that to be low. We would like the smallest possible interval that still achieves good coverage. And we'll compare here to an Oracle baseline. Um, recall that the 
what we're doing here is we've got our original observational study plus five artificially biased ones. The algorithms we consider don't know which ones are biased, but the Oracle is the one that only uses uh, data from that original observational study, the least biased one in some sense. Then uh, a, meta, a standard meta-analysis approach, which assumes that all of these observational studies are unbiased, uh, gives somewhat poor results, uh, poor coverage in particular. Um, a variant of our method, uh, XOCS here, uh, assumes that all of these studies which pass the hypothesis testing phase are free of bias and then proceeds like a meta-analysis and does a little bit better, um, but again, uh, doesn't account for the fact that just because you pass the test doesn't mean you are free of bias. And then our approach, uh, XPCS, or Extrapolated Pessimistic Confidence Sets, uh, gets similar coverage and interval length to that oracle shown at the bottom. So with that, I'm going to wrap up this part of the talk. Uh, we've talked about here a method for using RCT data, when it, even when it doesn't include the population of interest, to nonetheless help us estimate co uh, causal effects in these populations. And the key idea was we use the RCT data to relax the typical assumption that all of the observational studies we have access to are unbiased, instead assuming just that at least one was unbiased. Um, but with that, I'm going to move to sort of the final part um, of the talk today, switching gears a bit to uh, prediction models. So the first two things we talked about were more about kind of treatment policies and uh, things like that derived using ML. Now we're going to talk about stress tests for prediction models um, and assessing their robustness to change in clinical conditions. And the perspective we're going to adopt is that of a model developer who wants to proactively assess whether or not their model will perform well across different settings, uh, where in particular, our focus is going to be on stress testing models without access to additional data. So a common setting, if you're a commercial model developer, you have data from maybe one or two hospitals, but not every conceivable hospital where your model might be deployed. And before I talk about what we do, I want to motivate a bit, you know, why our predictions might be unreliable. And there's a lot of reasons, but one perhaps interesting one in healthcare is that models can pick up on correlations caused by healthcare processes. So for instance, it's been observed that the timing of a laboratory test is often as predictive, if not more so, uh, than the test value itself. Intuitively, if someone gets a laboratory test done at 3 a.m., that probably means they're very sick. Secondly, you know, deep learning models have been shown to you know, pick up on and rely on so-called spurious correlations, correlations between things like the X-ray scanner brand and disease, correlations that are induced by something about the way in which X-ray scanners are assigned to patients. So the question will be, you know, how sensitive is our model to these types of changes and correlations, as well as potentially many others? And so with that in mind, we're going to proceed in kind of two steps. The first is to define the set of changes that we're worried about. That's step one. Um, and secondly, to actually kind of find the worst case change and evaluate worst case performance. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a bit more detail. Um, but once I do, I'm going to talk a little bit about what this is useful for here at the bottom in terms of informing model design there on the left and yielding insights into the vulnerabilities of our models on the right. But this is the kind of cartoon I want you to have in mind as I go through some of the more perhaps technical stuff. We have some model, and on the original data, it has some accuracy, like 90%. And we're going to be asking questions like, how would our model perform if we went to a hospital where the only difference was that patients were sicker, so disease prevalence on the x-axis is higher? Or if we went to a hospital where there was less availability of testing, uh, or some hospital that differs along multiple dimensions? Now, of course, there will be many more dimensions in practice than just these two, but that's all that I can visualize on a slide. Um, so the way we'll formalize this is to say we have a fixed predictive model and samples from that original distribution. And the goal here is going to be to specify a set of plausible alternative distributions. That's kind of this red squiggly area where each distribution corresponds, you can think of it uh, as a hypothetical hospital. And then the question becomes, what's the worst case performance, like the worst case accuracy over this set uh, for, again, our fixed original model, and which distribution in particular would lead our model to perform most poorly? And so now I'm going to talk about sort of both of those pieces in a little bit more detail, um, where I've just sort of distributed them now sort of horizontally across the slide. The first part is defining this set, 
I've described it very informally, and now I'm going to formalize it a little bit, the set script P, which we call a parametric robustness set. Then the second step is, you know, it's easy to understand what we're trying to do. I won't talk in too much detail about how we do it, but we simply want to sort of find the distribution that causes us to perform most poorly. And then this expression on the right, it, you can think of the supremum as a maximum. So this is the maximum expected loss of our model um, where the maximum is taken over those distributions. But I'm gonna spend more of my time talking about this first piece here. Um, and I'm gonna illustrate our general approach with a sort of specific um, illustrative example. So suppose that our data is generated in the following way. We have patients, they have some uh, risk factors, medical history, et cetera. Based on those factors, they either do or do not develop some disease. Uh, then when they come to the hospital, based on a combination of their history, as well as perhaps symptoms of that underlying disease, a doctor does or does not order an x-ray. And then if an x-ray is ordered, we have the x-ray scan available. And you might imagine training some classifier based on those three inputs on the right-hand side to predict whether or not someone has disease in the first place. And the question, and a question you might have thinking about changes in clinical practice is what happens if there's some change in the availability of x-ray scanning, either going from one hospital to another or over time? And we're going to use that example to build a, a sort of set of plausible alternative distributions. So first step is to specify, translate this into a specification of what can change sort of more formally. That's shown on the right-hand side, where the part of the distribution that changes is shown in red where I'll just note that we only need to model the shifting components and don't actually have to do any modeling of the rest for those who are interested in sort of estimation details. But secondly, and this is where there's perhaps a bit of a unique flavor to our approach, is choosing some kind of parametric form uh, for this shift. So for context, we require that each shifting variable is exponential family. So if that's not familiar, you can think of that as uh, generally always holds if a variable is binary or discrete, like whether or not you order an X-ray, um, but it also contains variables like Gaussians and so on and so forth. And the specification of a shift will then be these parametric shift functions. I've shown the general form here, um, S, A, Y given delta. Um, any parametric function can get plugged in here, which is a nice piece of generality, but perhaps not as helpful for uh, maybe understanding the simpler cases. So I want to illustrate that simpler functions can encode constraints. So I'm going to replace this with a example of a very simple function, where I've replaced that function, that S, by just delta. And what we're capturing here is a class of plausible distributions, where each one corresponds to a uniform increase or decrease in the availability of X-ray scanners. Now I'm going to return to this cartoon that I had on the left, and now I can formalize it a bit more, um, where these axes correspond to the value of these two parameters, delta 1 and delta 2 on the right-hand side. And this set of distributions is then just indexed by those parameters. And the benefit of this is that we can not only say something like, okay, our worst case performance goes from 90% accuracy to 70%, but we can actually pull out a description of what that worst case distribution is. So the worst case scenario in this hypothetical example is that you go to a hospital where there is say more scanning and less disease. Now, as sort of promised, I'm not really gonna talk about the estimation component of this to avoid going into too much technical detail, um, but at a high level, if you're familiar with this sort of problem, um, we introduce an alternative here to kind of standard reweighting based approaches for estimating that inner expectation, which maybe plays a bit nicer with this type of optimization problem, um, at least empirically uh, and so on. But instead of dwelling on that, I, I sort of want to move on towards, you know, what is this useful for, um, you know, if you have a good way of doing a worst case evaluation. And the first component um, that I want to highlight is that you know, fine grain changes can help inform model design trade-offs. So I'm returning to this example here on the left, um, where on the right-hand side, all I've done is I've put up the quote-unquote standard model. That's the model that uses all three features. And the reason we care about sort of constraining these changes to be plausible is that, you know, a model developer may be making trade-offs between different modeling choices. So here, for instance, uh, on the right-hand side, I'm showing now two models where they only differ in their inputs, where the invariant model, quote unquote, is the one that only makes use of medical history and age. 
Um, now that model is, I'm calling it invariant for some uh, reasons related to the literature on causal prediction, um, but we can also see that it's invariant if we look at how these two models perform in comparison to one another. So that's what I'm showing here on the right-hand side, where on the y-axis, I'm showing the loss of the two models where lower is better. And on the x-axis, I'm showing the performance of these models across a couple of simulated uh, environments where the only thing we're changing in these simulated environments is the testing rate, um, similar to the shift shown on the left-hand side. Now, what we observe is that if the testing rate is around 50%, which is the distribution that both of these models were trained on, then the blue model, the model that takes advantage of all of the features, unsurprisingly, does best. But it is a bit sensitive to changes in this testing rate, um, whereas the, in, the model that only uses medical history doesn't exhibit any such sensitivity. Now, this is perhaps interesting to illustrate the non-robustness in a sense of the standard model, but the point I really want to highlight here is that if we have some prior belief about the size of plausible shifts, if we think it's not going to change by too much, um, for instance, that the testing rate remains in this gray band, then we may conclude, for instance, in this case, that we're actually better off keeping that standard model and not throwing away this extra information because the blue line remains lower than the orange line. Now, uh, having talked a little bit about informing model design by worst case analysis, I wanna also talk about um, how this approach can yield insights into vulnerabilities. So for this purpose, uh, I'm gonna use an example from image classification, a particular example where we know that models can pick up on perhaps spurious uh, correlations in data, and that is gender classification. Um, now we'll be asking the question, okay, suppose you have a gender classification model. Um, how sensitive is that model to potentially spurious relationships between the label and other attributes of the image? And on the right-hand side, I'm showing uh, an illustration of the types of variables we're talking about, where we're allowing for changes simultaneously uh, in the distribution of all of these other variables, except for the label itself. Um, now, these are all attributes that we observe in our data set. Um, and down there at the bottom, I'm showing the form sort of more mathematically, a change in the distribution of Z given Y. And just like my hospital example before, um, this parameter delta is going to not only describe the set of possible distributions, um, but as we'll see, it will also uh, give us some description of the worst case distribution itself. So what do I mean by that? Well, once we have our specification and we have our you know, plug in our data to uh, the method that I've described, we end up with not only an estimate of the worst case performance of our model, but also a description of the sort of worst case scenario in terms of model performance which in this case, uh, just briefly, is a distribution where uh, women wear less lipstick and men are less bald, um, suggesting that our model is maybe overly reliant, in this case, on sort of spurious correlations in the data. So with that, I'm gonna sort of wrap up this piece um, and zoom out a little bit. So I've talked about these sort of three lines of work. Um, and if I were to categorize them at a bit more of a high level, I would say we've talked about assessing reliability and improving the reliability of ML systems in healthcare. Now, I also have some other work, which I'm happy to talk about offline with folks around improving the reliability of prediction models more directly. Um, but also, I, and I think this is an important area, developing methods to help us better understand our data in the first place. You know, what populations are well represented? What decisions do doctors tend to disagree on? Where therefore there might be some potential to aid decision making with machine learning. Uh, but zooming out even further than this uh, and returning to this question that we started the talk off with, um, I think it's useful to return to this analogy of drug development where uh, a lot of what we've been talking about is essentially pre-deployment safety audits, um, which is analogous to preclinical studies in drug development. Now, these are studies in drug development that happen before you ever put a drug in a human being, even in the context of a clinical trial, you know, animal studies, toxicity screens, et cetera. But I think it's also useful to think sort of in the machine learning context, um, not just about these safety audits and using that to go back and inform the models we develop, but also learning from deployment in the sort of analogs of clinical trials for machine learning models. And finally, thinking again in an analog to post-market surveillance for drugs, 
more about the monitoring and adaptation of models once they're put out into the wild. And I have some sort of open questions that uh, I think are perhaps interesting to discuss. Happy to do so in the Q and A or you know offline as people desire. Um, but one one thing that I think is interesting in the pre-deployment safety audit space is how we think about um, scaling up these sorts of auditing mechanisms for models that are trained on internet scale data. So there's a push now towards uh, large models of all kinds, large language models and so on and so forth, um, foundation models, et cetera, where the hope is by using bigger and bigger data sets, we can get better and better models. A challenge is that bigger and bigger data sets often means less and less well curated data. Um, so I think there's an interesting challenge in scaling up the types of uh, methods I've discussed here for that type of setting. Secondly, uh, when you talk about learning from deployment, um, one way in which machine learning models are not like drugs, so I may be overusing the analogy, is that they're changing, you know, or at least we would like to be able to update our models as conditions change. So suppose you run an expensive randomized trial for a machine learning model. Uh, you would hate to have to rerun that randomized trial every time that you retrain the model. And so I think an interesting set of questions lies around how you formalize that problem um, and when you can sort of convince yourself that actually that's not uh, necessary to do by thinking through uh, generalizable learning of the causal impact of deployed systems. And finally, uh, I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done around how we monitor these systems, adapt them to new settings, um, but do all of that in a kind of controlled and transparent way so that we're not invalidating all of the prior work um, that we've done up to deployment and making them robust. Um, but I'm gonna sort of end there uh, and I'm happy to take uh, questions. Michael, thank you. Um, so we have uh, some questions trickling in. Uh, first of all, please put your questions in the Q&A box. I know panelists can directly ask the questions. Uh, we have a question from Andrew Ben. Uh, the question is uh, regarding the accessibility of the data, right? So, so how do the limitations in the availability of open access fully featured medical data impact this work? Um, so yeah, and that's a great question. I think um, I would say two things to that. Um, one is uh, there are medical data sets that are available. Um, and so that is sort of a helpful thing for the community. Like the mimic data set that I talked about, right? The, the initial example I showed where I was looking at patients and notes, that is actually a data set that you know you can access as a researcher um, without being sort of affiliated with Beth Israel Deaconess. Hospital. So there are open data sets out there, and but it is a problem. And there are organizations um, th that are working towards sort of come up with more curated, publicly available data sets uh, to help us, you know, unlock some of the potential here that we you know, progress that we've seen in other fields uh, of machine learning when there are sort of commonly shared benchmarks available. Um, but secondly, I'd say it also just raises interesting challenges. Um, I, you do have to deal with it at some level. Um, and some of the methods that I've talked about, like combining data from multiple sites in the observational studies case, are really motivated by some of the real world constraints um, that you have in a medical domain uh, around kind of data sharing. So I don't know. Uh, yeah. So on that note, questions. excellent. Yeah. I think this is so important. I just wanted to let folks know, um, for example, IEEE, you said many organizations, right? Within IEEE, there's a data port. Uh, initiative. So dataport.ieee.org. Um, that has lots of lots of data. Um, I just thought i uh, let people know that. Uh, you might have used, uh, Michael, some of those, but I'm not sure. Um, there may be other organizations, right, that make this data available. So this, this is important. Yeah, and, there's, and, and there is also now a little bit more of a commercial interest in um, coming up with uh, data sets that you can use to benchmark your algorithms on. Um, and so hopefully, you know, that will also spur the development of more kind of open data sets, though, hopefully in a, um, you know, ethical way and all of that, of course. Right. Um, privacy is a big concern, obviously, with medical data, which is why, which is what we're all balancing against. Tony, you have a question. Um, you want to ask that? Yes. Thanks, Ashutosh. Yeah. And, and uh, Michael, thank you for the wonderful talk. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing you on campus next year. Um, my question has to do with the first part of your talk. Yep. Are, are you using high fidelity 
uh, digital twins in that model? Or if not, is there a role for digital twins in that process? Yeah, so digital twins, as I understand it, um, you know, is this idea that, you know, if we had enough data, you know, or we had enough understanding of hu the human sort of bio human biology and so on and so forth, the whole hope is we could simulate in a sense, like what would happen to someone if they were treated differently. And that is, uh, I'm not sure if I would necessarily call the models that were being used in the example, like super high fidelity. Um, but part of what I was talking about in the first example is essentially a challenge with those types of models where you're trying to simulate forward um, that aren't resolved by just getting more and more data. You know, if those models are fit based on just correlations in data, and that's how you come mm. up with your digital twin, um, then they can be misled. I mean, the simple for all of these things, a good intuition pump is to just think, what if I had some data set with basically no features? And I just saw, like I had that example, the outcomes and what treatment you got. A very simple, you know, digital twin is just predicting for each person the average outcome for uh, the treatment that they got. Uh, and that can be misleading if you're then going to try and use that to conclude what would have happened differently um, if you sort of gave them an alternative treatment. Um, Great. Thank you. Helps. Yep. Uh, all right, folks, if you have any question, uh, please put it in the Q&A box. I have a question myself, Michael. Um, and on this specific slide that you're showing, uh, one mm -hmm. of the thing you have like widespread deployment. Uh, yeah. How do you have you have you tried to see the potential challenges? Uh, what are the road roadmap to that? Yep, for sure. So the um, the antibiotic, uh, well, okay, challenges to widespread deployment. Um, there are obviously technical challenges uh, as well as logistical and just administrative challenges uh, with widespread deployment of systems. Um, so there's a lot I could talk about. I think I'll focus on, um, you know, the way there is a lot of work being done to ease the technical, like infrastructure barriers to deploying something broadly. So um, a lot of medical records companies, there's a couple of big ones like Epic Systems, which I mentioned earlier on, um, have developed, you know, app stores of a kind um, to help uh, make it easier to deploy models on their infrastructure. There is uh, government mandated um, aspects of this, which require a certain amount of interoperability. Um, and on the academic side, there are people who are working to come up with, you know, data models, uh, ways of structuring your data, such that someone can write code against that standard database specification that will then work on many different health systems data. Um, so there's barriers coming down in that sense. Uh, so one of the main challenges becomes sort of how do you evaluate, how do you trust these models? Like, how do you know whether or not a model that someone else developed will actually perform well at your health system? Um, and because there is, you know, a cost to implementing a lot of these things, um, that is something that uh, I think health systems are, you know, thinking through a lot right now, which is just sort of how do you do, uh, how do you tell if something is actually a good fit for your patient population? Um, Anyway, there's lots of other challenges, yeah. but those are just thank you. Some we have two more questions in the in the Q and A box uh, from John. Uh, which aspects of overall process are specific to healthcare application? Uh, in which directions can it be readily extended to other domains? So basically, applicability of this. Yeah, uh, of course. Yeah, um, I think I think this. Uh, you know, a lot of this is motivated by healthcare, but as sort of noted, it extends well beyond it. You know, there are a lot of settings in which we want to use ML to make decisions uh, in a way that is um, reliable. You know, one of my favorite examples, which, you know, is not from my own work, but um, which is also in this kind of perhaps social good space, uh, is there, you know, there's algorithmic decision making when it comes to things like refugee resettlement. Um, as one example, where the goal there is to predict, okay, if I'm kind of resettling someone, I want to put them in a place where they're most likely to succeed. Uh, if I'm thinking about where geographically to send someone. Uh, and of course, in those sorts of settings, you have all the same concerns about, okay, maybe there's some potential to help, but you know, I really want to make sure that my uh, models are doing something sensible and not something crazy and that, that my evaluations kind of make sense. Um, so basically, 
a lot of what I've talked about on the causal inference and prediction side is, you know, more widely applicable. I will say there are some ways in which taking the healthcare perspective, I think helps focus the mind a bit on um, the types of data we might expect to have in practice. So on the prediction side, what from what I've seen, it's very common in say computer vision to assume that the data we have looks like a benchmark data set. We have photos and labels, that's it. Um, in medicine, uh, when you think about searching for vulnerabilities, the reality is you, while getting access to data is difficult, when you have data, you might often have more than just photos, you know, x-rays themselves, but other sort of clinical context variables, um, which I think allows you to make more progress on some of these problems like um, uncovering vulnerabilities in models using that kind of contextual information. Mm -hmm. uh, but sure. Sort of okay. Thank you. Uh, Veronica, I may take one more question. Or uh, we still have time for one more, maybe just checking. Uh, so I think the question from Jan Jan, uh, when we co-analyze randomized trial data and observational data, how do we deal with the potential distribution shift between them? Uh, do you think there's an issue uh, that would consider? Yeah, great it? question. Um, I alighted over um, briefly. Um, it requires more assumptions. Um, so something that I alighted over in the uh, context of presenting that particular work is there is an accounting that we have to do for a potential shift between the observational uh, study and the RCT in terms of just the type of patient population. So within a particular subgroup, you know, you may have generally older, younger, for instance, people in the observational study versus the RCT. Like with a lot of other things in causal inference, um, you can account for that if you observe it. Uh, so there's uh, a lot of interesting work in kind of transportability um, of RCT results, um, which sort of get at this um, type of distribution shift between essentially the RCTs themselves and sort of the populations that we observe more generally. But that's sort of the short answer. Yeah. You have I, to make assumptions, but then if you do, you can account for it. Yeah. And the last question briefly, uh, do you think there's a similarity to neurosymbolic AI? Uh, do you think this work can be Further, uh, further by incorporating guardrails, in addition to explainability. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's interesting. I think um, when I hear neurosymbolic AI not being in that sort of space myself, what I'm interpreting that as is, you know, perhaps more interpretable models that are sort of making decisions based on sort of well-defined concepts and rules and things like that. Um, so, assuming that I've gotten that roughly right, uh, I think there is a lot of potential there. I do think that what we often want when we what we really want when we say we want interpretable machine learning um, is we want something that's reliable something that's going to work in the way that we expect it to um, and the hope is that by understanding how a model is making its decisions we can sort of reason about internally whether it's going to encounter some failure mode um, i do think i lean a bit more towards uh sort of abstracting things away and trying to do that type of um, testing more directly for failure modes. Um, but I do think that the approaches complement one another. I think that's all we have. Uh, thank you for an excellent talk and so interesting to see how this can be used for not only health domains, but other domains as well. Um, so with that, Veronica, I think we are done for this. So thank you everybody for attending and asking questions. Uh, I hope to see okay. you. Next Thank year, you all. Michael. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate it.